perhaps not, though there are a few surprises as Equinox goes gathering intelligence. Five seconds. Sequencer is now controlling the final second. T minus 20 seconds. Mark. T minus 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10. We're go for main engine start. Seven, six. We have main engine start. Three, two, one, and liftoff. Liftoff of Discovery. Through its triumphs and disasters, the prevailing image of America's space program has always been one of openness. Unlike the Russians, the United States would take up the challenge of space in the full glare of publicity. But glare can hide as well as reveal. And there is no doubt that the restarting of the shuttle flights has meant a good deal more to some Americans than to others. The space shuttle as it exists today was quite literally designed for the specific purpose of carrying intelligence satellites into space. The size of the payload bay, the uh, mass of the payload that it can put in orbit, and even the delta wings on the shuttle and the thermal protection tiles on the shuttle were all dictated by the requirement for putting low altitude photoreconnaissance satellites into orbit. The most sophisticated US satellites can photograph objects on the Earth's surface a mere six inches across, or pick up telephone calls of officials deep within the Kremlin and walkie-talkie communications of Soviet troops. Thus, technology has changed the tools of espionage from the cloak and dagger to the satellite and microchip. Jesus, Ron McNair, and, uh, pilot Mike Smith, followed by Krista Masala, teacher in space. But two years ago, this triumph for the American intelligence community turned to bitter tragedy. Fortunately for America's spy masters, the space shuttle was not the only means of delivery for their secret spy satellites. The dependable Titan 34D rocket had for years been used to launch satellites. But once again, disaster struck. Within months of each other, two Titans exploded seconds after liftoff, and the Titan was grounded. The Titan rocket accidents have probably had a bigger impact on America's space program than the much more publicized Challenger accident with the shuttle. Normally, we'd like to have two or three photographic reconnaissance satellites in orbit at any one time. But as a result of the loss of uh, Titan 34D in August of 1985 and April 1986, we went for uh, almost two years uh, with only one uh, intelligence collection satellite in low Earth orbit. This series of disasters, coupled with intelligence failures in Iran, where American agencies had failed to predict the fall of the Shah, and the Middle East, with events like the bombing of the Marine barracks in Beirut, left many questioning whether the United States had gone too far in depending on technology to take the place of the traditional clandestine human agent. Whether the machine, having sent the human spy into early retirement, was now beginning to self-destruct. Rivalry between spies and spy technology has been going on for a long time. Every capture, every betrayal involving human spies has simply heightened the bureaucratic desire for a clean, reliable machine which could replace them. Human spies are messy. They're complicated. Uh, sometimes they get caught. Sometimes they, they betray you. Sometimes they have inaccurate information, whatever. All of these things make it a lot more difficult 
than having some nice little machine up in the air or buried under the ground or somewhere else. And there is an assumption, which I don't think is necessarily accurate, that what you get through a technical resource is cleaner, more reliable information than what you get from a spy. War, too, has been a great stimulus in the development of spy technology. In World War I, the need was for accurate information to help break the stalemate on the Western Front. Uh, in 1917, at a critical stage in the war on the Western Front, there were a lot of people, mostly French and Belgian peasants, behind the Western Front, um, where the German armies were, who could provide priceless intelligence on what the German armies were up to, troops being moved up to the front, and so on. But how were they going to be able to uh, tell Western intelligence? Somebody had the brilliant idea of dropping pigeons from balloons by parachute, which they did by a bizarre Heath Robinson apparatus. And the amazing thing is, that it pretty much worked. Suspended beneath the balloon was a cross frame attached to an alarm clock, and hanging from each of the four points of the cross frame was a small parachute holding a pigeon basket. Having allowed for the wind speed and direction, the alarm clocks would be set to release the pigeon baskets over enemy occupied territory. There, French and Belgian peasants were asked to fill in a questionnaire about German troop movements and attach it to the homing pigeon's leg. Hundreds of valuable intelligence reports reach the Allied lines, often within hours. But not all pigeon spy missions were so successful. The whole series of pigeon balloons, uh, the alarm clocks went off early, and these pigeons did not land on enemy territory. Uh, they landed on Canadian troops on our side of the Western Front. And I regret to say that every one of these top secret pigeons was eaten by Canadian troops. It is surely no accident that World War I, the birth of modern warfare, coincided with a huge development in the technology of spying. Photographs were taken from the air, both from balloons and from aircraft. Radios picked up enemy communications or coordinated artillery fire. The technology of, of espionage has been far more spurred on by war than by peace for the simple reason that governments and high commands are far more conscious of the fact that they need intelligence in war than in peace. They're prepared to devote far more resources to it, put far more people into it, spend far more money on it. And when you put far more people into things, spend far more money on it, you get far more advances. After the First World War, most of the Allied spy scientists were quickly and perhaps short-sightedly laid off, and funding was cut. But in the Third Reich, during the 1930s, while the Fatherland was rearming, Germany's spy scientists were at their busiest. Their greatest triumph, or so they no doubt thought, was the development of the Enigma encoding machine. Uh, the key lies in these encoding wheels and also in the uh, front panel wiring here. The way the rotors so fiendishly the complex was the Enigma, with its rotors and random wiring producing literally millions of variables, that Germany considered its codes unbreakable. But technology, while a good slave, is a poor master and the Germans would pay dearly for their faith in it. Early in 1940, a hastily assembled team of British scientists broke what was considered unbreakable. Thus, throughout the war, Churchill was privy to the plans of the German high command, a state of affairs so secret that news of it was not released until 30 years later. It meant almost certainly the difference between losing the war and winning it. Although for many in the intelligence community, the Second World War was the heyday of the human spy working behind enemy lines with just a suitcase radio and a code book, there were, just as in World War I, huge advances in spy technology. Alongside the increased interception of enemy signals, there was a considerable refinement in aerial photo reconnaissance techniques, often at great risk to the pilots. Alongside the aerodrome. Here 
here before the eyes of the RAF photographic experts is unfolded section after section of the German line. They see the River Rhine winding far below. They see enemy gun emplacements and forts, the grey masses of troops on the move. From their records will be pieced together a gigantic map of the Western Front of Germany at war. The main legacy of World War II to the post-war intelligence uh, community was to leave them with an unanswerable argument that intelligence actually mattered. Nobody could ever again argue that intelligence didn't matter, that you didn't need an intelligence community. Nevertheless, in the immediate post-war years, Britain ceded its intelligence supremacy to the United States. The Cold War had begun, and Stalin, an ally against the Nazis, was now vilified. The Central Intelligence Agency, or CIA, was created to counter the Soviet threat. America had been traumatized by Japan's shock attack on Pearl Harbor and was determined not to be caught unawares by the Soviets. Having worked as a secret agent in the Second World War, Harry Rosicki was involved in the CIA's first major clandestine operation. Well, Operation Red Sox was a series of operations designed to get uh, agents with radio sets into the Soviet Union from 49 to 53. It was done on behalf of the Pentagon, and what they needed was early warning. And there was no conceivable way of finding out what was going on in the Soviet Union except by sending agents in by parachute. But Russia in 1949 was not like France in 1942. The welcoming committee were not friendly peasants, but the KGB. Operation Red Sox turned out to be a disaster, and most of the agents died. William Colby, a former director of the CIA, was also in the agency from the beginning. The communist controls imposed in the communist countries after World War II were just of such a draconian sort that the spies had a very difficult time operating at all or surviving. And therefore, using the techniques we had used in World War II just didn't work in terms of getting spies into uh, the Soviet Union in the 50s. And we had to devise other techniques, so we turned to technology to help us learn what was going on in that vast, denied area. The United States converted Second World War bombers into flying listening posts to fly along the borders of the Soviet Union. These missions, known as ferret flights, were made deliberately provocative, so as to alert Soviet air defenses and then monitor their radio traffic. But this was at the height of the Cold War, and like Operation Red Sox, the ferret flights were extremely dangerous. One B-29 was shot down with a full crew, which I believe was 16 or 17 Air Force people. Uh, in addition to that, there was a smaller plane, a B-26, that was shot down with one classmate of mine in it. The general and I sat back and mused about this enormously expensive way of trying to find out what was going on inside the Soviet Union. And whether it was his thought or my thought, we came up with the idea that if there had been faster airplanes flying higher with high resolution cameras, one such flight could do what a hundred agents on the ground could not do. The CIA turned to Lockheed Aviation and its brilliant aeronautical designer, Kelly Johnson. Inside eight months, the U-2 spy plane had left the drawing board and was ready to take to the air. Part glider and part jet, the U-2 was designed to fly nearly 14 miles above the Earth for distances of up to 2,600 miles. Placed in charge of the program, was Richard Bissell. It was a very high aspect ratio aircraft. It was, of course, very light. Um, it was using the, the latest version of uh, the then leading jet engine available. Uh, and the goals in terms of both range and altitude were set uh, well beyond those for any previous aircraft. 
in quality, it, it was superb because the photography has really never been improved on. I think even the latest satellite photography is is no better than the best U2 photography. The equipment may be somewhat higher resolution, but also it operates from a considerably higher altitude. Uh, so that whatever intelligence you could get from very good photography was obtainable from the U2's take. For four years, the U-2 flew intelligence missions high above the Soviet Union with impunity. Then, on May the 1st, 1960, Francis Gary Powers slipped a poisoned suicide capsule into his pocket, climbed into the cockpit of U-2 number 360, and took off from Peshawar, Pakistan, to photograph a Soviet missile construction plant. This was to be the last U-2 mission over the Soviet Union. Somewhere over central Russia, Powers was hit by a SAM missile. In the diplomatic row that followed, Khrushchev stormed out of the summit of world leaders in Paris. For the Russians, it was a huge propaganda coup. Contrary to all expectations, Powers had survived and was put on trial in Moscow. He was sentenced to 10 years in a Soviet jail, but after two years he was released in exchange for Soviet master spy Rudolf Abel. The exchange was symbolic of the different approaches to espionage of the Soviets and the Americans. Powers was a technician, reliant on the scientists at Lockheed to bring home worthwhile intelligence. Abel, by contrast, was a spy of the old school, who had for years provided priceless secrets from the heart of the Western establishment. Because of its emphasis on human spies, the KGB over the years has become a master of James Bond-style technology. In the Soviet Union, next to hockey, the national pastime is bugging and miniaturization. Keith Melton has the largest collection in the Western world of Soviet spy tradecraft. Not just toys for the boys, like this miniature bug, but sinister assassination devices, like this gas gun, concealed in a pack of Ukrainian cigarettes. In the propaganda war, the CIA is only too keen to expose bizarre Soviet murder weapons. Uh, this is an example of a Soviet cyanide gas device that was used in an assassination. It fires hydrocyanic acid, and the principle was very simple. It was cocked. There's a small orifice at the front. Within the weapon is a small primered charge and an ampule. Once it's fired, the charge breaks the glass ampule, and the cyanic acid is vaporized and is projected in a small stream. This weapon would typically be rolled in a newspaper and carried in a hand, and when the target was faced, the newspaper would just be placed into his face, and then pressure would be used, and it would be fired. An estimate in the early 1960s was that out of 150 questionable deaths of Soviet exiles uh, living in the West prior to 1962, subsequent re-examination indicated that up to 50 were most likely the result of some form of hydrocyanic poison. One objection to human spies is that they may defect to the other side. Stanislav Levchenko defected to the West in 1979 and now lives in hiding in the United States. During the 1960s, he was trained by Soviet military intelligence, the GRU, to be infiltrated into Britain should there be an international crisis. His mission was to go to Liverpool and monitor shipping movements in and out of the port. He was to be given a map reference for a buried radio that he would retrieve to transmit his information back to Moscow. Uh, GRU, which is uh, Soviet military intelligence, uh, representatives in uh, uh, Great Britain, you know, uh, like to go to all kinds of picnics in Sussex, in uh, Wales, or wherever they're permitted to go by, by the foreign office, you know. And if you watch them <clears throat> very carefully, 
uh, during those picnics, you know, um, they will have tendency to, 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 to go into the ground, you know, I mean, to, to bury something there, you know, something, you know, wrapped in uh, special paper or whatever, and, uh, which means they're burying their transmitters and money for uh, future people like I could have been. In 1980, a mysterious package was found here, buried on a remote hillside in North Wales, in a field that was being ploughed up after lying fallow for many years. The ploughman took what he had found to Eddie Voyle. The young farmer was ploughing this field, and in, in the course of ploughing, he came across a black sack, and he opened the sack, and inside there was a tin, and inside the tin there was a compact wooden box and with a key to it. Now he opened the box and discovered there was some sort of a wireless in it. Well, to me, as an ex-serviceman, I knew straight away that it could pass messages. The radio turned out to be a Soviet transmitter, manufactured in the 1960s. Further inquiries in the nearby village and a study of the hotel register revealed that in 1971, four Russians had stayed at the local hotel. Later that year, these same people were among a group of Soviet diplomats expelled from Britain for activities incompatible with their diplomatic status, the official euphemism for spying. Western counterintelligence is well aware of Soviet spy transmissions. GCHQ, for example, from its headquarters in Cheltenham, operates a sophisticated chain of listening stations set up to locate radio transmissions. For obvious reasons, filming is not allowed behind the closed doors of GCHQ. So to illustrate its methods, we went to the Federal Communications Commission in the United States. The FCC uses the very same techniques to detect illegal commercial radio. A number of listening stations fix a bearing on the transmission and then these bearings are triangulated to determine the exact position of the transmitter. So I'll go ahead and take my bearing. I'll activate the DF and take my bearing on this particular subject. Turn the uh, rolling rubber on. Turn the CRT unit on. Go to the CW position on the receiver to offset the beat frequency oscillator and uh, set the cursor up for the bearing, which in this particular case I'm getting 197 degrees on this uh, particular station also. And we'll use the mid scale Even the most sophisticated triangulation centers require a relatively long period of transmission to fix the location of the secret radio. To escape detection, both the Soviets and the Americans have developed the burst transmitter. This is a GRA-71, which is a standard military militarily designed burst transmitter and basically what this is doing you have a magnetic tape that runs through here and by picking out the next message I want to send is U okay then you want to send R then you want to send A and you'd convert your message onto a magnetic tape then the magnetic tape would be put onto this burst device wound up and then this would hook to a small receptacle on this Delco 5300, and at the given time, once we were sure that you had the proper frequency, you would simply send the transmission, and you would burst everything over. And at that time, in just a matter of seconds, you could send an extremely long transmission. Spy and counter-spy. Each new development in spy technology seems to be met by its countermeasure. It is a game where no one is ahead for very long. Or is it? By the 1960s, there was a new development which would revolutionize the world of espionage. The camera and the bug would be lifted out of reach of missile or counterintelligence agent to the frontiers of space. We save £30 by going direct. Ring free phone 0800 335 335 if you're a low risk driver and find out if you can save 20, 40, up to £60 off your comprehensive motor insurance. GA Direct. We can help. 
You know, when I was a kid, my mum always ball washed things to get them really white. But you can't with today's clothes, can you? So how can today's mums get close to boil wash white? My little girl, she's got this security blanket and she drags it everywhere. It gets really filthy. Look at it. I really wish I could boil wash, but I can't. It don't up the size of a hanky. Thank goodness for Daz Ultra. It's made all the difference. I don't have to put up those dingy whites anymore. Look, that's a really bright white. Even my mum would be proud of that. So, Wendy, would you... Well, I know what you're going to ask me, and the answer is no. Daz Ultra. Today's way to get close to boil wash white. At a price that's right. Here at V Delta Soon, we believe everyone can have salon beautiful hair. But everyone's hair is different, so how do we do it? New V Delta Soon Salon Collection. Salon shampoos and salon conditioners. You select your own combination, so it's tailor-made for your particular hair. For salon beautiful hair. New V Delta Soon Salon Collection. Tailor-made for salon beautiful hair. There is only one man who can help you make a real Mexican chili. He is the hombre from Home Pride. We all know what greasy grime can spell. Use Neat. Flash not only fights germs, but it cleans the greasy grime where germs can breed. <coughs> Vinos make three different types of cop mixture. For example, Vino's expectorant formula relieves and soothes chesty coughs by easing congestion. And like all these Vino's formulas, it does so without causing drowsiness. Whichever kind of cough you may have, there's an effective formula to suit, because no one knows more about coughs than Vino's. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. The space program appeared to embody the very best of America, man at the frontier of science and exploration. The quest of man in space was hailed as the dawn of a new era. In fact, America's interest in space was largely motivated by the intelligence community. We tried using balloons. They weren't very reliable. We tried using airplanes. The Soviets shot down Gary Powers. And it quickly became clear that if we were to find out what was going on in the Soviet Union, we'd have to do so from space. So uh, the Kennedy administration formed an organization called the National Reconnaissance Office. And for over 25 years, we've maintained almost continuous surveillance of the Soviet Union using satellites from space. Space is regarded by both superpowers as neutral ground. So if the technological difficulties could be overcome, space was the obvious place for espionage. But satellite surveillance posed enormous difficulties. Compared to even the latest U-2, which flies at a maximum altitude of just 14 miles, the first satellites flew at about 120 miles. Inevitably, the quality of photography proved to be inferior. Thus, the development of spy satellites required technological advances, not just in spaceflight, but in film manufacture and lens production. At the ITEC works near Boston, Lenses are ground for use by the reconnaissance satellites to a phenomenal degree of accuracy. The final polishing, which may take months, is to remove minute bumps, which are identified by laser and which may be only molecules high. Once produced, the lenses and cameras are subjected to a battery of tests to simulate the stresses of space flight. The availability of satellite photographs of the Soviet Union, the Eastern Bloc and China revolutionized the world of spying. In the superpower race for good intelligence, 
the United States appeared to have gained the upper hand. But just when spy technology seemed to have made the human spy completely redundant, a new war began which raised doubts about the usefulness of the expensive spy satellite program. In the jungles of Southeast Asia, satellites were of little use because their emphasis was on strategic anti-Soviet espionage. To fight the war in Vietnam, the US military needed technical devices which would provide tactical intelligence on the ground. Among the devices which saw service were remote electronic sensors dropped from the air close to the Viet Cong trails to give notice of enemy movements or sounds. So once again, spy technology was disaster-led and war was the great stimulus. Another lesson of Vietnam was the importance of low-level aerial reconnaissance but flying low over the jungle meant risking enemy ground fire and hundreds of pilots died trying to provide good photo intelligence. To avoid similar casualties in a future war, Lockheed, the makers of the U-2, have developed a low-level spy plane, not unlike a glorified model aircraft, which flies by remote control. This thing is very survivable and has had uh, numerous tests to uh, determine its survivability characteristics. Uh, we've had uh, absolutely no problem surviving in, in, uh, in real live battlefield type environments. First of all, it's a, a fairly small air vehicle. It's fairly maneuverable. And, uh, and when it's painted in the camouflage uh, uh, gray or, or blue paints, it's, it's very hard to see in the daytime. It's a very low radar cross section and provides hardly any heat source for an infrared system to look at. Okay, I'm headed north right now. Where do you want to go? Uh, there's the target range. Once launched from the back of a truck anywhere in the battle zone, the remotely piloted vehicle, or RPV, relays its pictures back to the mobile command post. I think I'm going due east again, Dave. Okay. You're looking south, huh? The two operators can control not only the direction of the RPV, but also that of its camera by using a simple joystick. The camera is mounted in a large sensor ball in the belly of the plane. Since the ball itself can be changed, the same plane can carry either daylight or infrared night cameras, or even a laser-assisted camera for extremely accurate range-to-target calculations in a battlefield scenario. The RPV operates at low altitudes, but Lockheed also make a high-flying spy plane, aerodynamically similar to the RPV, for use as a long-distance spy plane against non-eastern block targets not covered by satellite flight paths. The Black Bird was conceived in 1960 and developed in total secrecy. Even today, its optimum capabilities are a matter for conjecture. Initially codenamed the RS-71, President Johnson fumbled the first public announcement, calling it the SR-71. In the best traditions of sycophancy, the plane's name was immediately changed. In regional trouble spots like Grenada or Nicaragua, the Americans have had to rely heavily on the SR-71 because the spy satellites in orbit carry only a limited amount of fuel for changing their position. It was to overcome this problem that the space shuttle was designed. It provides a mobile refueling and service module to increase the lifespan and maneuverability of aging satellites. The most important satellite serviced by the shuttle is the Keyhole, or KH-11, which for over a decade has been providing continuous coverage of the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc. Unlike earlier satellites, the KH-11 doesn't use film. Instead, a bank of photoreceptive cells relay digital data to ground stations in the US. 
This information is then converted into computer images. One of the values of an interactive display like this is that you can quickly flicker between two images. Among all the other enhancements that you can perform, we can see things rather clearly, roads coming in, construction in the airport area, and quickly monitor all changes. These images were taken by the commercial organization EOSAT, whose satellites investigate the Earth's resources and its environment using similar technology to the KH-11. What you're looking at here in this case is a hard copy print of Cairo at 1 to 50,000 scale. You can see the airport very nicely. You can make In addition to producing ordinary photographic images, the digital information supplied by the satellite can be manipulated by the earthbound computers in a variety of ways, depending on the user's requirements. Here, for example, this simulated high-speed flight around the Los Angeles area and along the San Andreas Fault was produced from a single satellite image. But whilst a commercial operation like EOSAT can tell its customers in the Midwest or in Africa that their fields need watering or they need new fertilizer, the smallest area that its satellites can distinguish is 30 meters square. The capabilities of the latest spy satellites are far greater. The best resolution that you could get if you were looking straight down on a clear day would probably be on the order of a few inches. Uh, if you were to go out into your backyard and put three large grapefruits on a picnic table, uh, and the satellite flew overhead and took a picture of those three grapefruits, and then you took the middle one out, on the next pass, the satellite would be able to tell that the one in the middle was missing. These photographs, taken by the KH-11 from 120 miles high, were leaked to Jane's Defense Weekly in 1984. The American official who leaked them was imprisoned for two years for compromising national security. They show with extraordinary resolution a new Soviet aircraft carrier being built at the Nikolaev 444 shipyard. However, the KH-11 is ineffective for much of the time. If you have any type of serious cloud cover, then the satellites are simply useless. All they would photograph are, are the top of clouds, which doesn't provide you with very much intelligence. And at nighttime, um, it, may, it may be the case that they do not have any sort of sensors, infrared sensors for nighttime photography. And if they do, it would appear that at this point they don't take very good photographs. Poor weather conditions are not the only problem for satellites. General George Keegan is a former head of Air Force Intelligence. They deceive us by publishing very widely throughout the Soviet Union the schedule, the orbital schedules of American reconnaissance satellites. They know when we're going to appear over what spot that is sensitive in the Soviet Union. And during those time periods when a facility on the ground is vulnerable to observation, then the Soviets are under uh, instructions to conceal those activities, put the things inside hangars, go into secured areas, get under cover. Uh, the Soviets reputedly built a very large inflatable rubber submarine and put it one of their submarine yards and we thought it was a real submarine until a storm came along and bent the thing in half. Uh, but I think that in general, uh, photographic intelligence is regarded as providing uh, probably the clearest and least ambiguous uh, source of information on what the opposition is doing. To guard against possible deception, and provide further intelligence, the US has also launched a number of listening satellites designed to monitor and record electronic communications around the world. The most advanced of these is the device codenamed Magnum, the world's most sophisticated bug. The launch of the Magnum in shuttle mission 51C was shrouded in secrecy. The media were warned by the Department of Defense that any release of information about the payload would be a breach of national security. The electronic intelligence satellites are probably almost as important as the photographic satellites. Uh, these satellites are literally big ears in space that can pick up 
telemetry from missile tests, that can locate uh, air defense radars, uh, or they can locate uh, uh, military headquarters by their radio transmissions. All the signals collected by these satellites are relayed to the headquarters of the National Security Agency at Fort Meade in Maryland. Bigger by far than the better known CIA, the NSA controls an empire of spy technology and the world's largest computers. It has over 20,000 employees in the United States and thousands more working in listening posts around the world. It also maintains total secrecy. Even filming the outside of these buildings is discouraged. If something happens that's absolutely critical to the security of the United States, what they can now do is get that message onto the desk of senior government officials in Washington in something like 10 or 15 minutes time. And the fact that all of these listening posts talk to each other and that they are in turn integrated with other intelligence agencies means you have what is called all source intelligence fusion put together in a very quick period of time. Intelligence from NSA listening posts feeds steadily into the top secret operations room at Fort Meade. But in a crisis, the tempo changes the highest grade of report is codenamed a critic. Andrew Webb worked in the operations room. A critic is a real-time report that, that is sent by a field unit, be it a ship, a plane, uh, a land site, that requires instant action by somebody in the U.S. at NSA, the president, the Defense Department, something like that. It's something that... Uh, you don't just send out lightly, like when, when uh, oh, a Soviet destroyer rams into an American destroyer at sea. I mean, that kind of thing. You wouldn't even rate a critic. It's really, really hot stuff. Aside from the bombing of the Marine barracks in Beirut and the downing of the Korean airliner, the main critic during Webb's time at the NSA was the invasion of Grenada. This invasion revealed a major flaw in the NSA's capabilities. I think the first lesson is that we have too many resources, too many electronic intelligence resources dedicated to the least likely source of problems in the world, meaning the Soviet Union and the, and the, the People's Republic of China. Um, we had so little dedicated to um, the third world, which is where the hot spots are, that uh, well, we were running pillar to post um, during that Grenada invasion, um, just trying to keep our heads above water. There were only four people in the operations center who had anything to do with the third world, whereas the Soviet side had probably 30 or 40 people, and the Chinese side had maybe 20 or so. For an old CIA hand like Harry Rositsky, much of what Webb says is all too familiar. I would say that an awful lot of the coverage of the Soviet Union uh, has been overdone, even in my day, uh, that there was such a mania about Soviet capabilities and intentions uh, that I think we've wasted millions on that. And yet the issues of the last uh, 30 years have not been Soviet military action, but they've been things like North Korean military action like Pakistan-Indian action, Chinese action against India. And now, of course, uh, the whole imbroglio in the Middle East. The weakness of U.S. intelligence assets in the Middle East was revealed during the 1979 Iranian Revolution. The Americans had been relying for intelligence on the Shah's secret police, SAVAK, and accepted their reports that the situation was under control. The American intelligence agencies, with their heavy reliance on satellite signals and photographic surveillance, were to regret their lack of human intelligence, or humant. It was presumed that because we could see everything in a photograph, you didn't need agents anymore, and you didn't need to send spies in, and therefore you could rely exclusively on the photography. That turned out to be a near catastrophic series of bad judgments, 
And so over the years, we spent more money. We put more money into acquiring ever more and improved photographs. And we began to neglect very seriously the human side. The Soviets, by contrast, have not neglected human intelligence. The KGB dwarfs our own intelligence agencies and, to the despair of some Western counterintelligence experts, is aided in its endeavors by the relative openness of Western society. I don't have any idea, really, uh, what the number of, say, CIA people in Moscow is, but it, it must be a very, very small number. There are uh, Soviets alone in the United States, enough officials, so that probably there are about 800 intelligence officers in Washington, New York, San Francisco alone. Working from places like the Soviet Trade Mission in New York and other similar agencies, Soviet spies are increasingly interested in gathering commercial and economic intelligence. 80 miles west of New York City is Vernon Valley, a year-round ski and pleasure resort. Over the last few years, 12 Russian diplomats based in New York came up to Vernon Valley for weekends. But they weren't just here for fun. Across the valley lies the major communications hub for Wall Street, the financial district of Manhattan. Much of the telex, fax and telephone communications from the city is relayed by microwave to Vernon Valley for transmission via satellite to destinations all over the United States. Eavesdropping on this traffic, using the very latest technology, is what the Russians were interested in. Over a period of months, two reporters, Bob Windrum and Oksana Komut, pieced together for the local paper what turned out to be one of the most important Soviet bugging operations ever uncovered in the United States. Every time a Soviet leaves a 25-mile radius of his home city, whether it's New York, Washington, or San Francisco, he has to request permission to travel from the State Department. And those records are obtainable under the Freedom of Information Act. And we were able to obtain, under the Freedom of Information Act, um, a variety of agents' travel records. And it was a simple case at that point of putting two and two together and then working from that premise and ultimately getting confirmation that uh, the reason they were coming here was for electronic eavesdropping. For the electronic eavesdropper, the most vulnerable facilities in Vernon Valley are those which pick up the incoming microwave signals from New York, the so-called repeater stations. The main repeaters for New York City are lie on top of Hamburg Mountain, which is where the amusement area is and the ski area. Uh, right on top of the mountain there, the lift goes probably only about 150 feet away from the repeater towers themselves. We were told by, um, by sources at the FBI that this was an intelligence operation, that the intelligence operation was not only suspected, but that there had been found electronic eavesdropping devices near the repeater stations. The Soviet operation at Vernon Valley is a good example of the way in which technology has changed the role of the human spy. Admiral Stansfield Turner was head of the CIA under President Carter. Well, one of the interesting things is the human agent and the technical collection are in a sense merging because one of the things that a human agent often does today is to implant the technical device. I mean, if you want to listen in somebody's bedroom, you've obviously got to get a device into the, to the bedroom. Let's make it the office, for instance, or into somebody's office. Well, that uh, doesn't just uh, happen. You send an agent in to do that. So often, rather than collect information himself or herself, uh, what the agent does is get the technical system in place and, and operating is the kind of teamwork that we've got to have. During his years at the CIA, Admiral Turner presided over a major part of the scaling down of old-style human intelligence operations in favor of the expensive satellites and listening stations of the technological era. The paradox of this revolution in spy technology is not that the intelligence agencies now have too little information, 
but that frequently they have too much of it. A satellite is a continuous information collector. It continuously beams down information to the United States about Soviet activities. When you have dozens of satellite, these things are turned on for 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. The amount of information that comes out of them is just staggering. It's something which just has to be experienced to be understood. Even during my uh, work in, in, in the intelligence community, there wasn't any question that the amount of material procured through these highly competent technical means far exceeded either the needs of the analysts or their capabilities of handling them. There is a point at which data becomes absolutely irrelevant. In 1982, with the military dictatorship at the height of its power, technical intelligence about Argentina was voluminous. The NSA was reading Argentine military and diplomatic traffic. Two photo reconnaissance satellites were passing over the country twice a day. Another spy satellite was recording Argentine electronic emissions, and the SR-71 spy plane was making regular flights in the area. In fact, so much data was being collected that most of it was effectively useless because it was not processed until after the Argentine invasion of the Falklands. To try to overcome the problem of information overload, computerized systems which respond to key words are already in place to help sift incoming written data like telexes. But monitoring conversations is far more complex. The idea that you could have robots out there listening for certain key words is, to my knowledge, beyond the capability of uh, artificial intelligence. If you're listening into people talking, the Russian radio pilot, you still need a head inside of a pair of earphones. Now, it's true, we can tape that conversation. But we do not have the capability, to my knowledge, to have a computer listen into the conversation and then alert someone if it's an important conversation. We still have to have a human operator listen to that. Information overload or not, the next generation of United States photo reconnaissance satellites is now ready for launching. The restarting of the shuttle program, after exhaustive tests and modification, comes not a moment too soon. Superseding the KH-11, the KH-12 will have the ability to see through clouds using an imaging radar and greater maneuverability in space so that the opposition will not be able to predict its orbit. So the future is one in which everybody will know everything about everyone else. The monitoring of arms control agreements has only become practicable with the advent of spy satellites. But all this infrastructure of spy technology is costing billions of dollars. Does there not come a time when enough is enough? If you look at what we're gathering today and yesterday, we've never known enough about Soviet weapons technology, Soviet missiles. There were always questions we could never answer. When it comes to the question of preserving Western civilization and its values and deterring destructive war against it, I know of no expense that ought to be spared. I know of no priority in a free society that ranks higher than the priority of assuring survival. And we ought not to be playing games, in my opinion, with the question of how much is enough. I think in the long run, this whole business of espionage and its import, the importance of spy reports to a government has been enormously exaggerated. Uh, almost all the issues of serious interest to a government I know of, 95% uh, of the information is available uh, not through agents. And I think if the uh, espionage human agent apparatus of the French, the British, the Germans, the Americans, and the Russians were wiped out today, I don't think any government would suffer.